I do appreciate everybody being here, not only our senators, but also our guests, members of the Commission on Black Medical Students, and all of you who are watching over the live stream that has been set up for this special ceremony. In particular, I would like to thank and welcome Mr. Ethelbert Daniel Bartholomew, who is with us today, whose father, Ethelbert, was affected by the black medical student ban for making the journey from Montreal for today's event. We're gathering prior to Senate today to apologize formally for a past wrong that affected many people and contributed to a culture at Queens that was neither welcoming nor inclusive of black people. Last fall, Queen's doctoral candidate Edward Thomas gave a presentation to Senate on his research regarding a 1918 motion to ban students of African descent from the School of Medicine. Although black students were admitted to the school starting in 1965, archival evidence suggests the historical facts of the ban were misrepresented by the university in 1978, in 1986, and in 1988. Through his research, Mr. Thomas brought to light the continued existence of the 1918 motion, and on October 30th, 2018, the Senate passed a motion to revoke the January 25th, 1918 motion not to admit black students to the medical school. This is a difficult chapter in Queen's history. And I'm thankful to Mr. Thomas for working so hard on this and for bringing it to our attention so we can acknowledge and take responsibility for what happened over a century ago. We cannot change history, but we can learn from it. And that is a continual process one which we remain committed to. Publicly apologizing for the 1918 ban on black medical students is an important part of the university's overall efforts to create and encourage a culture that is welcoming to all people of all backgrounds and color. I'd also like to thank Dean Richard Resnick for showing leadership to address this issue specifically through the Commission on Black Medical Students. The Dean and I will, in a few moments, sign the letter of apology, and he will then read from the letter and provide more details from the Faculty of Health Sciences. Associate Vice Principal Stephanie Simpson will then speak about the work of the Commission and the work of the University on Human Rights, Equity, and Inclusion. Dean Resnick, will you please join me at the table? First, uh, I would like to um, join Principal Wolf in thanking uh, Daniel Barthol Bartholomew for joining us today. Um, it means a great deal to all of us that, uh, that you've taken the time and effort to come and, and join us and help us uh, commemorate this moment. Uh, the letter of apology that uh, Principal Wolf and I just signed is only one part of our plan uh, for addressing the harm uh, that Queen's caused through the unjust motion uh, that was passed uh, uh, just over a hundred years ago, uh, but it's a significant part uh, because it's important that we as a, a university admit our wrongs uh, and take ownership uh, of them. In this letter of apology, we say, we are resolved to confront our past actions and more fully to understand the meaning of the university's historical racism, including a commitment to identify its causes and consequences to the best of our ability.
We understand that our actions have negatively affected students and prospective students. We understand that our past actions contributed to a broader North American pattern of denial of access to equal medical opportunities for black practitioners and patients alike. Uh, in reckoning with our institutional history, we are committed to acknowledging our failures and to learning from our mistakes. We will ensure that this episode of the university's history is acknowledged in a public space on campus. In doing so, we will integrate the lessons from this racist ban in the curriculum of undergraduate medical trainees as part of their broader training on social bias and systemic inequality in medicine. We will also commit funding and resources to support the recruitment and training of black medical students to address persistent underrepresentation within the profession. It's our sincere desire to confront this past, to learn from it, and never again to repeat it. This is only a brief excerpt of the letter we just signed, but I want to highlight it. I wanted to highlight it here because it shows that we want to reflect on the 1918 policy in order to better understand what we need to do going forward. And apologizing is really only the beginning of the work. Uh, later in the Senate meeting, after Senate convenes, I'll take a few minutes and give a short presentation to say a little bit more about the actions that we're undertaking in the School of Medicine, some of which I alluded to in the passage. While we are profoundly regretful of our past wrongdoings, we also want to use this moment of reckoning as an opportunity to re renew our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity in the School of Medicine. We're dedicated to these principles and to doing all that is necessary to ensuring that the school is accessible to and culturally safe for everyone. I'd now like to invite uh, Stephanie Simpson, our Associate Vice Principal of Human Rights, Equity, and Inclusion, to say a few words. Thank you, Dean Resnick. First, I would like to say how grateful I am to have had the opportunity to serve on the commission alongside colleagues and students dedicated to moving this issue forward in the most thoughtful and respectful way possible. I'm particularly grateful to Edward Thomas, whose diligence and firm commitment to justice and truth telling have brought us all to this place. I too would like to thank you, Mr. Bartholomew, for taking the time to be with us today. I wish to address these brief remarks to everyone gathered, but most importantly to the memory of those affected by the 1918 ban and their descendants. This is indeed an historic moment and one that we acknowledge is long overdue. But it is important for you to know that the students of the 1918 ban were never forgotten. In the midst of denials, mischaracterizations, and silences, your story was told. It found its way into the scholarship of those who possessed both an audacity to question and a commitment to the truth. Knowing as Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us, that truths crushed to the earth can only rise. And as black and racialized students, we carried your story forward, generation to generation, because we recognized the adversity that you faced in the struggles of our own parents and grandparents. We experienced your story as somehow connected to our own and treated its preservation as our solemn duty. Many would say that institutional racism is rarely as explicit today as it once was, but the challenges faced by racialized students, staff, academics, professionals, and community members remain deeply entrenched. This is why we have not forgotten. You were not forgotten, and today we renew our pledge that you will not be forgotten. Recently, Queen's had made significant strides towards embedding equity, diversity, and inclusion 
within all aspects of its core mission. But the work of remembrance and of ensuring that everyone is able to access opportunities and to participate belongs to all of us. We can and must move beyond the symbolism of moments like this, as rich and significant as they are, toward fulfilling the promise of genuine reconciliation, inclusion, and accessibility. Honoring the legacy of medical students of African descent and all those whose contributions have been unrecognized or unrealized due to racism and discrimination requires nothing less. <laughs>